Today, the Akron Roundtable is pleased to host a biomimicry panel who will discuss the topic, Biomimicry in Northeast Ohio, Creating Conditions for Place-Based Innovation Inspired by Nature. I will now ask Dr. Scott Scarborough, President of the University of Akron, to introduce our presenters. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My good friend Fran asked me to introduce the program today, so I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Fran. I had lunch uh, recently with uh, 10 youngsters who were part of the LeBron James uh, Family Foundation Wheels, on, uh, Wheels for Education program. And to my amazement, uh, predominantly elementary age school children, and guess what they wanted to talk about? Biomimicry. I realized I was in trouble uh, at the beginning of that. Uh, they knew all about it. And uh, perhaps because, you know, they're looking down the road to their own futures. And, and in Akron, that means biomimicry. The rapidly growing field that some say could be transformational for our regional economy. Uh, here's what I know about biomimicry. Like polymers, it has the potential to bring the eyes and the talents of the world to Northeast Ohio, where it's already bringing students, we call them fellows, from all over the world to study at the University of Akron in our unique integrated biosciences PhD program. It is allowing our university to create an interdisciplinary program that includes students and experts from the sciences, engineering, and the arts working together to understand how the study of nature can help to solve some of society's most pressing problems. And it's helping us forge strong and innovative partnerships with industry and businesses to develop new products based on nature's secrets. Most of you have read about her work with geckos, those fascinating and sometimes stubborn little creatures that are helping us to develop products that are stickier and stronger than anything currently on the market. New adhesives are just one example about the sciences behind the color of eggshells. New coatings and paints are born of such scientific discoveries. The people you're about to hear from understand the extraordinary dynamic when academics and entrepreneurs and innovators come together to invent new ways to solve problems. Their efforts underway in Northeast Ohio over the last several years are accelerating the, the global emergence of biomimicry, efforts led by Great Lakes Biomimicry, the University of Akron, and other partners, including numerous other regional colleges and universities, our friends, our colleagues, blending the capacities for fundamental and applied research brought by universities and practical application brought by business into a novel regional ecosystem. The recent editorial of the Akron Beacon Journal said, we have an edge in competing with others around the world in this field because of the scope and the depth of this activity. My word to these wonderful scientists and scholars is let's keep this momentum going in this city of invention. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce to you your moderator today, Rebecca Badley. Rebecca? It's a pleasure to be here today. It's such an exciting topic to talk about biomimicry and the innovations, um, and great to be in Akron, which has been so at the forefront and the heart, um, which, uh, which we'll learn about more um, on the panel today. So I will quickly introduce um, our panelists. We have Tom Terrell, who's a serial entrepreneur and founder uh, and CEO of the Great Lakes Biomimicry. Um, we have Peter Navarowski on this side. We just call him Peter, <laughs> such a great last name. Um, and he's a professor of evolutionary biology and integrated biosciences at the University of Akron, uh, where he is in charge of the Biomimicry Fellowship Program, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And in the middle, we have Matt Ochaya, who's an associate uh, professor uh, business Administration and Director of the Entrepreneurship and Sustainability MBA programs at Baldwin Wallace University. So we have a fairly diverse panel and um, I think you'll see that they bring many different perspectives around what biomimicry can accomplish and how we can be extremely innovative in this space. So I'm going to start off with a pretty general question. 
Um, just about sharing kind of your favorite example of biomimicry, because I think that's a great um, area, and then how you're advancing, you know, this field in, in Northeast Ohio. But first, I also have to, I didn't introduce the gecko. So for those of you who can't see, this thing scares me to death, because it makes little noises, which you probably can't hear. And I jump every time, so if you see me jump, it's because the gecko made a noise. Um, but Peter will talk more about that. So, Peter. Thank you. This, this is Christine. Um, or number 12, depending on your perspective. Uh, I have just two uh, examples of biomimicry. I have to talk about the one that I know something about, which is geckos. Um, I started studying geckos um, in 2007 um, after I learned that a colleague at Akron, Ali Gidejwala, who's at table 20, had already invented um, a carbon nanotube mimic of the gecko topads. Uh, since that time, I've come to learn how, how they work, and we're studying how to do more. Um, basically, they have tiny little hairs on the bottoms of their feet, about a tenth or maybe even a fiftieth the, the diameter of a human hair. And they, they're just like split ends, and they end in these little tiny plates called spatulae. They're like the size of a virus, so they're tiny, tiny things. But they're so small that they can make intimate contact with any surface, which means that they're attracted to any of those surfaces by intermolecular forces, which are really weak. Uh, over uh, the over short distances, but when you multiply weak by uh, many millions of times, you get a strong force. So a gecko like this or two geckos could support my body weight if I could get them to cooperate uh, and scale the wall. So that's that's one of the my favorite examples. The other so that's about material. The other is a, uh, uh, an example from ants. Uh, ants have taught us a lot about how to move information. Um, ants uh, when they start their foraging cycle leave the nest to go looking for food, and the first ants that leave move in a random way to try to find the best food sources. Uh, but all ants leave little scent trails as they move. Uh, and so when ants leave later in the cycle, they can actually detect the scent trails of the ants that have gone before them. And the ants that find really good sources of food really close to the nest, which is the best kind of food to find, uh, get to that food, carry it back to the nest really quickly because it's close. And they end up leaving really strong scent trails. And when the ants go after them, they pick up the strong scent trails and they get to the closest, best quality of food. And it turns out we route uh, information on cellular networks and computer networks using that kind of algorithm, which a bunch of brilliant computer scientists uh, figured out uh, about 20 years ago. So those are two of my favorite examples, one about process, one about material. Um. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, I'm from Valen Wallace, so I know that uh, one of the things that we're trying to instill in our students is clearly, you know, the examples that we're talking about today. Um, it's also at this time of the year when I really get homesick. Uh, I, I, I look outside, and uh, those of you who know me, I'm, I'm from Uganda, East Africa, so this is a very unnatural environment to be in, uh, right now. Uh, but I, I am very comfortable around Catherine the gecko because uh, that's the kind of thing that you see around in, uh, on the dark Christine in the gecko. Yeah, so if, uh, if you know anything about the continent, you know that there's all kinds of creatures and people really do immerse in nature. So it's not unusual uh, for folks to take that kind of thing for granted. However, one of my favorite examples of biomimicry, this is one that I talk about all the time, uh, is what termites do. Uh, so when you, when you look at termite hills or, or mounds, they, they can be up to 30, 40 feet high. Um, and yet, you know, the continent itself can be 30 degrees you know, in the morning in one location and 110 degrees by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. What's really intriguing is that if you were to stick a thermometer in one of those termite mounds, what you find is that it's a constant 87 degrees, plus or minus one degree, all day long, 24 seven. How do they do that? Well, they do that by making these little holes, uh, and, and you can watch them do this, and as a kid, I used to run around these termite hills and just watch these termites do that thing all day long. It's like, well, there's gotta be a better way to, to make a living other than just opening and creating holes. I didn't understand why they would be doing that as an only sole job. Well, now we know that by doing that, they're actually modulating the temperature within the time I hill to a termite perfect condition of 87 degrees, 24 seven. So there are architects now in South Africa that have studied this phenomenon and are now constructing office buildings as well as um, uh, residential buildings that are you know, four, five, six stories high to mimic the construction 
within a termite hill. And now they've cut down on heating and cooling costs by 90%. So when you think about that, a day like this, where we're, you know, we're coming around with heavy coats, somebody should be looking and say, what can we learn you know, from the natural environment so that we are constant 87 degrees or whatever, how perfect the thermometer is. So that's one of the examples I'd like to talk about, and I'm sure I'll have an opportunity to talk about more. Um, uh, as I was uh, walking from my uh, office to my car today, uh, and feeling the temperature, I figured that someone in the audience was going to ask us, what's the biomed solution for being cold? Um, there's no easy ones right now, um, but I did want to mention that just because that would be my favorite at this point in time. <laughs> but the, my favorite is I'm a scuba diver. I've been a diver for about over 25 years, and I, I like di diving in heavy currents. When you dive in heavy currents, you get to see the fish maneuvering in ways that are extremely different one from the other, to be able to stay in the current and stay in the same place. Many of you are aware of the fact that most of the electric vehicles that have come out in the early phases of them are not exactly the typical shape that you would think they would be. They're actually kind of boxy and kind of squarish, and the reason is is they model those after a box fish. Well, box fish is, looks like those cars, and it has these really tiny um, uh, uh, fins on them as far as keeping it going. So you get the sharks that are moving like crazy and all these other fish, and you get this little box fish that you figure just going to blow away. And he's just sitting there with this shape, with these little tiny fins, and I could never figure out how in God's name that fish stayed in the water until I got involved with bottom memory and realized that the shape of that fish was conducive to be able to move over the water, the water shape. And they're beginning to use this technology in many types of things, including ships, to be able to allow ships to, um, to move through the ocean um, and waterways with uh, far less resistance from, uh, from the, wa the water itself and uh, decrease very dramatically the fuel consumption. Maybe you can talk a little bit more now about the broader topic of how is Northeast Ohio really helping to advance the field? Um, of biomimicry. So, Ben, do you want to start with that? Yeah, you know, Northeast Ohio is so rich in so many different ways. And actually, you know, our mission states that, you know, we, we are uh, educationally driven economic development for the region, but to be copied by the world. And that mission is already putting us on the map uh, globally, uh, if, if you uh, kind of track this thing. So within Northeast Ohio, what you find is that there's a lot of really great uh, education uh, institu institutes of higher learning, but also STEM programs, uh, also uh, different types of uh, academic institutions that instill in folks uh, the inquiry uh, and the inspiration to learn more. Coupled with that, and in the room, I'm, I'm sure we have lots of representatives from uh, the corporate side of things, economic development side of things, which is also a major focus of ours. When you see how many of the community within the education community and the corporate world, as well as just a social uh, community coming together with biomimicry as its inspiration, I'm very excited that the potential that biomimicry has to offer and the fact that we're leading the world right now in being the thought leaders around this really important emerging discipline. It's not quite a discipline yet. It's not a new paradigm, right? As we, we know, nature has been doing this thing for 3.8 billion years. There's a lot of learning there. However, as a discipline, it's still an emerging area. So the leadership that the University of Akron is taking around this to be followed by LCCC and Valen Wallace uh, it's really positioning us to take advantage of the pos possibilities that biomimicry has to offer. So I'm excited about that. The, one of the things that makes success in any region is to develop things that are place-based. If you import companies and you put them here and you give them tax breaks, seven years later they're likely going to leave. And as I looked at biomimicry, the region, what the region said to me is that this was an extremely natural place-based environment for biomimicry. I've lived in 18 places in my life, and this was the only one that I've ever lived in that did not have a structure at the top between government education and business that was a formal process, or a highly a strong informal process. Akron significantly better um, over the last 25 years than Cleveland, but really um, almost bereft in terms of having the second tier of uh, people who go out and make things happen. Um, 
what there's usually a mandate or, or legislative issues that take that second tier and they're the ones who process it. But we didn't have that here for a lot of years. And what we did develop was a series of grassroots organizations of significance that most communities did not have. They took the place of what was happening. That's a place-based feature that we really never built on. And what's happened, what I've seen happen in the last three years or so is that lots of the leadership have gone down into these areas and begun to look at what are the real strengths that we have in some of these grassroots organizations and bring them in to partnerships with what we already have from governmental or educational institutions. And so as I looked at this, the confluence of that type of a situation in line with the significant emphasis that we put on STEM schools even more than any other area in the, in the country, such as starting the Isle STEM Learning Network as the first network that was developed in the United States, they came together in a real place-based feature along with the natural naturalness of our area with the tremendous amount of green space. It was a living laboratory concept. So as we looked at that and said, we can go ahead and do things with companies here to create ideas using biomimicry and at the same time, let's build an educational system starting at PK that by the time we've got the companies understanding how to use it, have drawn companies here, have gotten um, incubation in these companies, we now have the people who are going to fill those jobs. We've never done that in the region. We've gone ahead and changed industries, but we have never had the confidence to build an educational system, so we're always short. That's what I think Northeast Ohio is, it will give to us, and the fact that we're the ones who are developing the protocols for bonding, and the only ones right now, our students are going to be learning that. They're going to want that interdisciplinary in the colleges that they go to. If we're the only ones that have it, they're likely going to stay here where they would have gone off. And many of the students outside who are getting excited about biomimicry will look at Northeast Ohio as a bastion so we can turn around that whole focus of losing students and be able to bring them back in here. Yeah, I think one, one specific example is sort of, uh, what, what happened to me was kind of unusual. I, I, I got involved with a polymer scientist first, which was probably a mistake for a biologist. And then, and then I got involved with a business person, which was a, you know, strike two. Um, but what that led to actually is uh, kind of a, a specific um, kind of set of relationships that I think uh, characterize uh, the, the entire fabric that's being uh, woven here. So at the University of Akron, um, we, had, uh, we have 20 to 30 faculty members that are doing uh, academic research uh, in one or another area of, of biomimicry. And um, by connecting that to uh, businesses uh, that are interested in innovation and new ways of innovation, like through biomimicry, uh, we've been able to get outside of those, that the university silo walls, and connect the work around the basic research to the application in things like products and services. Uh, and we've been able to do that across disciplines. And that's definitely the model, this model of, of collaboration. The main fulcrum for that model uh, happened to be biomimicry fellows, and there are actually some in the audience today, if you guys would raise your hands. Biomimicry fellows, they're scattered around. Um, biomimicry fellows are uh, PhD students that are their, their PhD students have, have come from around the world because here they can be sponsored by a company for five years to be embedded in the R&D of that company while they pursue their PhD training in biomimicry through a very unique uh, program called the Integrated Bioscience Program, which allows us to build uh, tailor-made teams for each of these students that include designers, uh, engineers, scientists, and others as the needs vary for what these students are trying to pursue, whether they're trying to create new products or new services in social science areas, in business, uh, in engineering. And uh, those uh, collaborations have allowed us to also reach out to uh, uh, organizations that allow us to broaden our capacity for research and design. So for example, we have faculty from the Cleveland Institute of Art helping us teach the design end of biomimicry. We're also embedding students in the leading design firms in the region, in places like Nottingham, Spurk, and Balance. And so what students can do here in terms of being trained in biomimicry is helping to advance this emerging field globally, but it's also making a difference regionally with respect to the kinds of innovations we can expect to see out of coming out of Northeast Ohio and the kinds of biz businesses and creative minds we hope to attract over the next 20, 25 years. Can you mention a couple of the names of the businesses that these fellows sure. are placed in? I think that's helpful. The, they're, they're leading businesses that you'll recognize the names. Uh, Gojo, Parker Hannifin, Sherwin-Williams, Rossman Barnett, Goodyear, Blue Resolve, uh, the Cleveland Zoo, 
uh, the, there's a total of 15. We'll have 15 of these fellows in place uh, September of this year. We have six in place right now. Some of them have already completed uh, three, uh, two and a half to three years of their, their, their training. The other thing, Peter, that you brought up in your comments, which I was thinking about earlier, was the design characteristics of biomimicry. And, um, you know, it might just be worth 30 seconds on, because, you know, we talked about very specific technology applications of biomimicry, but then, well, if I don't do it justice, you can jump in. The systems of nature, how they interact, and what we can learn from those as we're designing more complex systems is also an interesting um, area of biomimicry. Does it need more explanation or did that work? So. Okay. Um, so maybe also m more specifically on a couple of programs, like I don't feel like we've talked enough about the K through 12 and kind of what's going on, or P through 12, and what's going on in those areas. So maybe somebody can, can jump in on that then. I can jump in on that real quick. So we truly understand that in order for us to think ahead to those 20 years that you're talking about, that we are prepared with the right skill set for the 21st century, uh, that we think in terms of what the business community, for example, is going to need, and therefore build that into the curriculum and the pedagogy of the students that are in place today. So we have built as GLBio uh, a framework where we look at the entire spectrum of P, K through 12, as well as higher education, uh, two year and four year, as well as post uh, you know, higher education, like the PhD program that Peter has talked about. I run the MBA program uh, in two different areas. Uh, this is part of that pipeline spectrum that we're talking about. So one thing that we have to take into account is that, first of all, everybody that is in this space uh, is going to be interested and passionate about different things. And yet, we see biomimicry not as a subject or as uh, a thing, but yet as one of those mindsets, the tools, that the lens through which you look at existing issues and ask the question, what would nature do to help you come up with a way to kind of instill the mindset of critical thinking, innovation, uh, and in our students, very young. Because you find that you know, when you have a five to 10 to 12 year old, you put them in nature and watch them play, uh, you know that they get it, and you don't have to explain it. Uh, if you go higher, well, we are a product of our upbringing and we pick up bad habits along the way, and those are hard to break. So it takes a little bit more time to instill this mindset in, in those kinds of folks. But uh, this is a concept of biomimicry that's easily understood. And so when we work with the PK through 12, uh, MC Square, for example, has already uh, taken this on. Uh, Lake Ridge Academy is revamping the entire curriculum to be biomimetic or sustainability based. Uh, Talmud schools are looking into it. Uh, so the, the mindset is there, uh, and the need and the pull is there. So it's just a matter of how do you build it within the curriculum so that it's not one more thing a teacher has to do on top of a full plate. And that's why you don't want to make it a program. You kind of embed it as part of the outcome they're already trying to achieve. So this is just a tool, a mindset, and K through 12 uh, uh, embracing it. Uh, University of Akron, uh, uh, Baldwin Wallace, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, LCCC has already seen that that is a powerful mindset to create and prepare the next generation of folks going into the workplace. One of the things I wanted to mention is in about five minutes we're going to start Q&A, so please be thinking about your questions um, for the panelists. So, sorry, Tom, go ahead. Um, I think one thing that's important since we're in Akron is that this really is a hub. What Scott talked about is, is exactly the fact we as an organization sacrifice raising money for ourselves to go out and raise the money from the corporations to be able to create jobs today. Because as you know in this region, if you're not creating jobs today, it's very hard to sell what you have. And so we knew that the fulcrum of this organization would be getting this PhD program in place. And so that's really worked. Now, because of that, we've been really integrating ourselves into the Akron school system. Tracy Buckner, who's got uh, more responsibilities than she'd like to have at the moment, um, has been extremely instrumental in helping us move into the Inventors Hall of Fame middle school and high school. She gets it. Um, we've gone up and worked on some foundations together. GAR has been very supportive of, of us here, Knight Foundation, um, Dominion Foundation. We've had a lot of people that have stepped up to begin to work with the schools in that process, and I think it's extremely important to, to, be, to note that, and we're beginning to branch it out. I spent uh, uh, the Akron Zoo, uh, Doug has been very deeply involved for about the last nine months in getting this, and we have a long meeting 
this past um, uh, this past Tuesday with some very exciting ideas of how we can broaden this thing out through the zoo into the Akron Summit County community. And I think with Tracy's assistance, there's a lot of novel programs we can we can do. And just the specifics of what he means by getting into the schools. We have fellows like those corporate fellows that are in the classroom working with teachers in the schools that were mentioned. So they're spending time uh, helping the teachers understand what biomimicry is. They're working with them in the summer around research to help them uh, fully comprehend biomimicry. And they're co-developing curricula for use in those classrooms. So that's a, that's a model that makes a lot of sense once you hear it, but it's not one that's typically used. We're connecting K-12, the, the minds and the hearts uh, of our future, uh, to the idea of biomimicry. We're working with the innovation landscape in terms of corporations. And at the, and the academic side, we're helping this field to emerge and move forward. Uh, so that's what we mean by fabric and ecosystem. So I guess the final question, you know, before we open it up to Q&A is, why should we care about this? How does it actually impact our lives? Well, <laughs> John Sangovic, who is the second in command at uh, NASA, who we got very deeply involved with, um, sent me an email over the weekend, and he really gets it, and he's been spending a lot of time with us and sending us all kinds of ideas of how we might work with NASA. He, he was driving with his daughter, and John's a graduate of the University of Akron, and uh, he was driving with his 19-year-old daughter in his car last week, um, and his daughter's also at the University of Akron, and he was talking about biomimicry and talking about the ideas and things like that, but he was doing kind of a questioning way, and he turned to his daughter and said, you know, why is this all happening? And she said, Dad, because it makes sense. And, and really that's what it is. When you see all of us, um, if we think about our childhood, we're out there in nature playing with, with bugs and playing with rabbits and running around and looking at things in a very natural way. Have we stayed in that environment? We've been using all those tools and the things that we're doing today. We didn't. Society put a veneer over us that stopped us from thinking that way. And so for a significant number of years, we've, we've really gone the opposite direction of nature. And today we're paying a price for it in things like global warming. Well, Every solution that's necessary is out there. 3.8 billion years of, of research and development. You just need to be able to learn the process um, and begin to think when you have a situation that says, what would nature do? When you watch young people's faces and you bring this to them, it takes about five minutes until they're totally into this process. And if we can build that generation coming up through, we're going to get many, many people in the world beginning to think. Before we jump to Madam Peter, I'm going to have Michael come up and explain the um, process of questions, and that way we can get that rolling as you guys finish up your comments. Very good. Thank you. As Rebecca alluded to, um, in true roundtable fashion, some of our best questions always come from our audience. So there are uh, no cards on your uh, tables. If you'd please uh, look for those and write down any questions that you have, uh, someone will be around to collect those, and Rebecca will be presenting those. So just quickly, why should we care? The National Academy of Engineers has uh, identified 14 grand challenges. Uh, these are challenges that uh, we, uh, in their words, uh, must solve uh, in our lifetime for, for society to persist as we know it. There are also challenges for which we do not have current technologies to, to address or to solve. So biomimicry is an important new tool, uh, formerly a new tool, that we can use to help address these challenges. And it's also a way of, uh, of moving towards innovation, but innovation in a sustainable way. After all, the things that uh, biological systems create are inherently sustainable over the long haul. So that's, I think that's an important reason for why we should care. Uh, before I went to Berlin Wallace, I, I, I actually spent 20 years in the corporate world. Uh, and my primary responsibility was as an innovator uh, and product development uh, leader. So I did that with a couple of 500, I mean, uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, and I got really sensitized to what we were doing through our products, uh, specifically to the environment for one. Uh, and so all the things, the grand challenges that Peter talked about actually touches on that. Uh, and so not seeing a good solution, and as somebody who was in charge of uh, creativity and innovation and not coming up with the right solutions, I wish I'd known about biomimicry earlier, because I think I might have applied some of those lenses to the problems that we were trying to solve. Now that I'm in a position of preparing the next generation of workers, uh, of business leaders, I really want them to have this tool 
uh, is not necessarily uh, the, you know, the, uh, the silver bullet. It's not going to solve every problem. But if you were to ask what would nature do and get some insights that you wouldn't otherwise have gotten, you're much further ahead at solving the problem than if you didn't do that. So for me, that is one of uh, the exciting reasons. And then lastly, I actually don't worry about the planet so much. Um, the planet's going to be here long after we're gone. The question is in what shape are we going to leave it? I worry about the kids, uh, you know, our kids, our grandkids. What kind of planet are they going to inherit from us? Biomimicry suddenly is one of those possible solutions that can position us to mitigate you know, some of the issues that we're dealing with right now using our own insights. Right, Over 200 years, we thought we had all the answers. Now we know we actually don't. We're making it worse. So why not? What is the harm in looking at biomimicry as a lens or a tool through which you actually can solve this problem? So I can guarantee you that's going to be impossible to get to all your questions because there's so many, which is very exciting. Um, we will definitely be around afterwards to, to continue to discuss. Um, but I am going to um, focus on a couple of questions, and I've grouped a few together. So question about is there either programs through the park system, and another was asking specifically about Cuyahoga um, National Park, and is there educational initiatives with those um, systems? Uh, Cuyahoga uh, Valley National Park, uh, I've been involved with them deeply, um, and also uh, Cave Metro Parks, we're beginning to talk with some, and all of them are partners of ours, and we are talking about um, doing programs, uh, youth programs primarily in the summertime, to be able to bring in part, for example, as part of the Environmental Educational Center at, um, at, the, at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Um, informal STEM learning also becomes extremely important in this process because many of these kids you can't reach necessarily directly in their in their in their schools, and so we're spending a lot of time with um, the zoos, museums, and those types of situations to put programs that they either get it in place of or they get it simultaneously with that program. So, uh, what we've got available today is we're building modules for education, principles of biomimicry being the first. That's a three-day program that we just did a beta test on, we'll ultimately have four of those. So we're in the kind of process over the next year, we'll have four to six programs that we'll be able to put out for people to look at that can come in and really get up to speed on what this is in a, in a way that doesn't require a lot of technical background. So I'm just gonna jump into another question. I thought this was interesting and, and kind of specific, but um, it says, why should a student like myself consider attending Akron for a PhD in integrative bioscience as opposed to a school like Caltech or others um, where you could do materials and then get into biomimicry later? That's a great question. Uh, so I'll answer it uh, unabashedly because you won't get the same kind of education there. So and, and here's, here's why. Um, so each of these students puts together a committee that's made up of uh, faculty members, mentors, that can come from business, they can come from sociology, they can come from design, biology, chemistry. Um, there are very few programs in the world uh, that allow students to put together committees that are that diverse. And all of these committee members end up becoming your, your mentors and your collaborators on your project. So the kind of interdisciplinary work that you can do, and then the kinds of courses that you can uh, choose from, which can come from anywhere on campus as they relate to your research goals, is a pretty unusual combination. In addition to that, the students that are in the cohorts that surround you come from backgrounds that could include design, architecture, engineering. These students are working with you side by side in laboratories and design studios, and again, finding that kind of an environment. And really, the PhD is very rarely these days about working alone. So finding that kind of diversity of colleagues in a cohort is something you'll find in just a few places. And uh, around biomimicry, fewer still. So you should come to the University of Akron. Um, we'd love to see your application. Um, so um, two kind of questions that are a little bit different, but maybe I'll sort of combine them and hopefully it doesn't get too confusing. How are you engaging with the local design community? And then the other one, um, but again, it's not exactly the same, but how can the arts benefit from biomimicry? So I don't know if we need to separate those, you can let me know, but Ben, do you want to jump in on that? Or? I'll let you take it. Okay. Uh, so how, how does an artist benefit? I, I think that um, artists uh, continually have conversations about process and creativity, about uh, natural artifacts, as well as human-made artifacts. 
Uh, they talk about spatial relations, relations between elements. Uh, these are at the core of thinking about biomimicry, uh, a systems level approach, being able to see things in more dimensions than three. Uh, these are things that artists deal with. Uh, and so this is a conversation they're already having. It's one that can certainly inform the conversation that engineers and scientists like to have as well. Okay. It actually does take all kinds, right? So you can't just focus on one dimension or one function uh, or, or, or one discipline. So for biomimicry, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, there, are, there is such a thing as subject matter experts uh, that you can call upon, which is something we're trying to build here in Northeast Ohio as well. We have the highest concentration, for example, of uh, biomedically trained uh, biomimicry specialists or, or uh, uh, what's the other one? Professionals, Professionals uh, in the world right here. So we can call upon these people so that you don't have to be the expert in biomimicry, but you can certainly be a subject matter expert in design or biology or something like that. That makes this a really powerful a little bit more in the design side because it really wasn't expressed as we've put partnerships together with design firms. Most people know Nottingham Spurk who developed Dr. John's tooth spin brush and lots of things like that. Uh, they're the recognized as the most significant um, product design firm in the country. Um, and we've gone to them, they are gonna be bringing a fellow in. Um, in addition, John Nottingham has joined our board. We also have partnerships with two other design firms that we put our fellows in for six week um, periods of time to be able to both contribute to the thinking of those firms and educate them and also bring something back from the creative side. The other part is, is that in the early phases when we prototyped the PhD program, we partnered with the Cleveland Institute of Art to be able to do so. And we're still in the process of working with them. In fact, uh, John Nottingham is on the CIA board is sponsoring a class um, at CIA to get them more deeply thinking of biomimicry to be able to draw these things together. Um, so we talked about from the student perspective. So from industry's perspective, does this create true innovations in quotes, or is it just incremental or just, I don't think it says that, for industry versus just being first to market? Let me, let me, let me take it on time. And hopefully, at the time, I won't uh, give too many secrets away. Um, Gojo um, is, was our first uh, corporation we brought in, and Emily Kennedy, who has an international relations background was the fellow we put in, but she matched up affinity wise. And after about a year of work there, uh, she convinced them to use a, a product design uh, process that used biomimicry. Typical firms, every firm, probably all of you out there, when you look at new product design, you get everybody together and you talk about what you have, you talk about what other people have, and you can kind of combine those into some evolutionary process. Um, and that's all it is, is evolutionary. Biomimicry requires evol revolutionary thinking. So at Gojo, they literally went through a three-week process to educate um, a fifth group of 15 people on understanding what biomimicry is, how you reference some of the um, areas in nature to be able to look at it. They had a problem that basically had uh, a device that used electronic um, power to be able to um, put a hand cleaner in the hands. Well, all of us know that been on cruise ship, doesn't work real well half the time. Um, it's not biodegradable, um, and D battery, D cell batteries are pretty lousy to the environment. So they set out with an objective of decreasing the energy by 50%, getting biodegradability into the system, and get a delivery system that worked far better. So they went through a process, um, three weeks. Uh, Tom was leading that process with Emily. Um, and they looked at things like speeding cobras and skunks and archer fish and the, the body's bloodstream and how water gets up to the top of redwood trees. And they came up with several models for which they applied patents. Um, if I recall, two of those patents went all the way through um, and uh, Emily herself is on one of them, which is pretty neat for an international relations major. Um, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but they feel that the products that they've developed could impact 50% of their product mix. And so this now has become a process that they're going to use more and more. That's what this is. It's getting in and thinking about it in a very different way. And there is a process you can use to do this. Okay, so we're jumping from the speed round, right? Um, so this, how is this field viewed by current scientific societies? Is it recognized as emerging field or do most scientists say, yeah, that's what we've been doing all along? I think uh, most would recognize it as emerging at a stage of exponential increase over the last five to seven years, I think publications and grants have tripled to quadrupled. 
Uh, we're still at a rate of 1,000 to 2,000 publications a year, strictly and narrowly defined. Uh, but I think most scientists would recognize it as emerging, even though it's a really old idea, old paradigm. So this one I'm going to read word for word. Given the ability of biomimicry to make improvements on traditional tactics we've taken for granted, are there possible natural phenomena that exist that could be implemented for the uniforms of the Cleveland Browns? That's a no. I just had to. <laughs> I couldn't let that one sit without uh, going over it. So um, I'll let each panelist address this one. What are the two to three support structures or wish list that are needed in Northeast Ohio to really increase the development of biomimicry? Maybe I should start because I'll probably be the shortest. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's twofold uh, answer to that question. One, if you look at the talent that we have uh, in Northeast Ohio, and you think of the skill set uh, that is required and the capacity that has to, to go with that. In other words, you have the skill set, but you don't have enough of them. I think this is a real key area of need for us right now. So to the extent that we can build and develop more biomedics and instill this idea of inspiration, uh, innovation through, through, through uh, nature, I think we would we, stand to, to gain a great deal. The second part, I'd probably let Tom address this, is suddenly comes to funding. Uh, there's a great deal of need in, in that type of uh, resource, and I'm sure if, if uh, there was somebody in the audience who we have been able to convert uh, and were to, to ask Tom, you know, how much would it take to, to do what you want to do and do it right, and he had to dunk his head under water for two seconds, I think he would come up with the right number for you, and I think that is what we need. Well, that, that's a good lead-in. Um, there are 40 networks in the world that are functioning um, using biomimicry. 23 of those are outside the United States. Um, the reason that they're doing that uh, is that there's a forecast that was done by Fermanian Institute of Nazarene University that said $1.6 trillion of global GDP is going to be attributable to biomimicry by 2030. So they're not doing it for fun. Um, of those 40, there's only about two of them that are working on economic development. One, a lot of it on tourism. The other 36 are all focused on network building. They're where we were 10 years ago. We are the only ones in the world that are doing educationally driven economic development. So we're getting calls from all over the world, Brazil, Germany, Mexico, saying, can we help them, can we help them? Well, it's hard to help them out of the vaccine like car because that's how we're, we function. Um, we're entrepreneurs. My partner and I, Don Connectus, who used to be at Goodrich here and ended up starting GN and then Poly One, we did this on our own dime. We knew that as a startup, you don't go and get money to prove a concept. You've got to have accounts and lawyers and a business plan. So we put, took the money, we put a group of people here that have spent 23,000 volunteer hours building to this point in time. That's unprecedented. So now we are outreaching because we're going crazy. The capacity building that we need with what we've done, there's so many people in so many schools coming to us and companies for support. There's not enough time in the day. Every time I go into meeting, like when I went with Doug last week for three hours, I came out smiling as much as I could. I went home and the next day I got up and I thought, oh, in God's name, I'm going to cover all this stuff with everything we got to do. So we've gone out now on initiation from a funding standpoint, and that's an important piece to build capacity because this is the center. We can make this the center of the world and get back to where we were with the DNA from the 1870s and 1920s in terms of being the most creative place in the world. So we're gonna wrap with those comments. Um, I did wanna mention that on your table is cards that have the uh, GLBio website on them, and you can sign up for the newsletter there, or you can put your business card in the basket out there and they'll sign you up for the newsletter. I really appreciate everybody's participation today, including the panelists. It's a very exciting topic, and as you can see, we are really the innovation center around biomimicry in the country and have a huge opportunity to be able to leverage that in many different disciplines. So thank you very much. Rebecca, Peter, Tom, and Ben, thank you for being with us today. On behalf of the Akron Roundtable, it is my pleasure to present each of you with a contemplative sun as a memento of your visit with us this afternoon. I'll provide these after, uh, after these remarks to make it simple. But as a preview, 
<laughs> this celebratory work of art was designed exclusively for the Akron Roundtable by Akron artist and craftsman Don Trump. Thank you. We invite the audience to join us at the Quaker Station in downtown Akron on Thursday, March 19th, when the Akron Roundtable will host Ellen Mosley Thompson, her professor of geography uh, at Ohio State University. She will be discussing global climate change, the evidence, challenges, and our options. Thank you for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you next month.